Okay, do I have the sound on? I think I do, thank you. Okay, tonight you're gonna get a really different message. And uh, it's based on this book I wrote a few years ago, if I can get this to advance. Maybe not, let me uh, get out of this and try again. Ah, here we go. It's based on this book I wrote a few years ago, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job. And it's the book of Job that says more than any other book in the Bible about how God created animals and designed those animals to teach his really crucial spiritual lessons. And so my theme is taken from uh, Job uh, chapter 12, verses 7 to 10, where Job says to his friends, ask the animals. Specifically, he says, ask the beasts and they will teach you. And the beast is a reference to the large uh, land mammals. Ask these mammals, they will teach you, or the birds of the sky, and they will tell you. And the rest of the book of Job is basically about the lessons that God built in to the birds and mammals that will teach us how we can come into a relationship with him. Now, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, you'll see that there are three distinct origins of life. Creation day one is where God creates the first life, but this is life that's purely physical. That's when God creates the microbes. And on creation day five, we get the second origin of life, where God creates animals that are not purely physical, they're physical and they're soulish. And so this is when God creates the birds of the sky and the sea mammals, and uses the word bara, the word to create something brand new that never existed before. And what's brand new about these animals, they're not just physics and chemistry. And then we move into creation day six. It, Bible never speaks about God creating the first land mammals. Rather, it jumps ahead to three highly specialized kinds of land mammals, the land mammals that are most crucial for launching and sustaining human civilization. And the message we're gonna see in the book of Job, we humans would have remained stuck in the Stone Age at a small population level if it wasn't for God creating and designing these birds and mammals to serve us in a very particular way. And you get a hint of this on creation day six, where it speaks about God, first of all, creating the short-legged land mammals. And that's a reference to the rodents. And you say, what do we need rodents for? Well, the thing we notice about the bipedal primates that preceded human beings, none of them wore clothes and therefore they were limited to the habitat space they could live in. They had to live in that region uh, where their naked body could actually survive. Some of them had a lot of fur, some of them did not. But humans were different, and God designed these rodents so that they like human beings. They're easy to feed. Uh, wherever we go, they're there. Uh, but because they're small mammals, they have to grow thick, luxuriant fur in order to keep their bodies warm uh, when they run into cool temperatures. They lose heat very easily to the environment, but they counteract that uh, by growing this thick fur coat. And humans very quickly, early in their time, uh, were able to uh, form relationships with these animals, basically breed them, and then use their coats uh, for fur. And for example, the Neanderthals have a body shape and size. They have a barrel-shaped body with short limbs, a huge nasal capacity. Everything about them is designed to survive in a cold climate. But what we notice is that the moment humans move into the region that the Neanderthals inhabited, they quickly began to live in climate zones that were 15 degrees colder than what Neanderthals could handle. The difference was the Neanderthals didn't have clothing, they didn't have control over fire, the humans had both. So it's thanks to the rodents that they were able to move into close, uh, cold climate zones. <coughs> but Creation Day 6 speaks about uh, two more sets of uh, mammals, the long-legged land mammals that are easy to tame. And this is a reference to the herbivores. They're easy to tame, and they can be tamed to do work for us. So these are the animals like the cows and the horses and the donkeys 
that humans use to do their farm labor. They're also the animals they use to get milk and uh, meat. And then the third category are the long-legged land mammals that are difficult to tame, the wild ones. And this is a reference to the carnivores. They do not make good farm animals, but they make excellent household companions. And on purpose, I chose a lion here, because while I was a postdoctoral fellow at Caltech, uh, there was a student there that every day would bring his pet lion to class. And lions are incredibly social uh, animals, and they love being around humans. And so he would bring his lion into the classroom, the lion would immediately run down to where the professor was, and then sit beside the professor, because that lion knew everybody would be watching. And uh, the highlight of that uh, lion's day was noon hour, uh, when the lion would be taken out to the Caltech lawn, and they would let out all the toddlers from the daycare center, and they would be able to romp with the lion. Now, what was also interesting, I would watch that student at 7 p.m. take the lion home. And he had this big van where he tried to get the lion in. The lion would act like a donkey. I'm not leaving this place. And so I'd watch him struggle trying to get the lion into the van because the lion wanted that social contact uh, with people. Now, uh, I shared this with my sons and they said, Dad, this has got to be one of your stories. This can't possibly be true. And by the way, there's a law in California now forbids you from having a pet lion. Uh, but I said, well, go online. And they went online and there was a photo of the lion uh, in a Caltech classroom. So I redeemed myself with that one. Okay. And the Bible refers to these animals as the nephesh creatures. The Hebrew word nephesh means soulish animal. And uh, the Bible defines the nephesh as the animals that God has endowed with mind, will, and emotions. And so they have a level of intelligence. They can form an emotional bond with one another. They can form emotional bonds with us. They have a relational capacity. They can relate to members of their species, and they can relate to us. They have a motivation and nurture. These are the animals that will sacrifice to care for their young. And they have a capacity and a desire to serve and please human beings. Basically, these are the animals we tame to do service, either uh, to meet our needs or to bring pleasure to us in the way they do their antics and entertain our children, etc. But Job 38 and 39 goes into much more detail about this special class of animals that God created. It expands on the very brief Genesis 1 message. Uh, and that one reason God created these soulish animals uh, was so that they can serve and please us. But notice what we see in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 2 is that God brings these animals uh, to Adam and makes the point that each one is designed to serve and please him in a different way. They're not all the same. Each one is a distinct way uh, they serve human beings. The other thing we notice is that they had these design features before we human beings show up on the scene. This is important because what you see in the atheistic uh, biological literature is that these animals adapted to us. But that means that they would get all these characteristics after we show up on the scene. And what we see is they had these characteristics before we showed up on the scene. And how do you explain that other than the fact that there is a creator that did this on purpose? Uh, but a lot of biologists have been very reluctant to accept that uh, biblical implication. Probably the most famous example of that would be Charles Darwin in his book, Origin of Species. And uh, he also wrote the book, Descent of Man. And when he said in Descent of Man, published in 1871, he said, the differences between human and non-human minds is simply one of degree, it's not one of kind. In other words, yeah, we have a better mind than they have, but there's really nothing different about the human mind than what we see in the mind of the ape. And as proof of that, he wrote that there is, quote, a much wider interval in mental power between one of the lowest fishes and one of the higher apes than there is between an ape and a man. But he made a specific error here. Fish do, are not nephesh creatures. They don't have a mind. So of course there's a bigger difference between uh, the, quote, mind of a fish and the mind of an ape. 
the fish doesn't have a mind. So yeah, there is going to be a bigger difference. Uh, both the human and the ape uh, have a mind. And, but it was Darwin, what I appreciate about Charles Darwin, uh, both in his origin of species and descent of man, there were several places in these writings where he said, this is my theory, here's how you can put it to the test to see if my theory is right or my theory is wrong. He was very committed to the scientific method. But in the case of his statement that there's really no difference between the human mind and the ape mind in terms of anything uh, that is specific and kind, he basically said, go out and test this with the different animals that are out there. What I find incredible is that the experimental tests that Charles Darwin recommended were not performed until the 21st century. For over 150 years, nobody did the tests that Charles Darwin recommended should be done to put his theories. Only now are scientists actually testing Darwin's claims about the minds of fish, apes, and uh, uh, humans. And in particular, uh, there's a paper written uh, by two biologists, Clive Wynn and Johann Bullhaus, and this is what they said. Like Darwin, biologists have tended to assume that species with shared ancestry will have similar cognitive abilities. Now, both of these biologists were Darwinists. They believed in naturalistic evolution to explain the history of life. And what they mean by shared ancestry is that if you look at the chimpanzee and the human, they have a lot of similar morphological structures. Their skeletons are somewhat similar. Uh, their body weight is somewhat similar. And so that's what he's referring to. And basically what Charles Darwin was saying is animals that have the most similar morphological features will also have the most similar features of the way their minds operate. But he basically said this needs to be put to an experimental test. But that's a foundation for naturalistic evolution, that animals that are most similar to one another physically will also be the most similar to one another mentally. Well, these two biologists decided to put that to the test, and what they discovered was Darwin was mistaken. Namely, that ravens far surpassed chimpanzees in intellectual capability. And if you want to go online, none of this was online or in any textbooks or research papers until the 21st century. But you can go to YouTube and you can pick up all these little video clips of what Caledonian crows and ravens, which are very closely related, can do. So for example, the great apes, the orangutans and the chimpanzees, they can get a food treat with a one-step process. Ravens can do it with an eight-step process. They can plan, they can think, they can maneuver. Go online, you'll see the amazing things they can do. My own father had a pet raven when he was a teenager. And uh, he built this big cage uh, for his pet raven. And uh, what he would do is he would lock the cage put a couple of metal filings in the, inside the cage, the raven would pick it up and pick the lock and jump out. And so uh, once it jumped down, by the way, it would only do that if my dad was watching. If no one's watching, nah, nothing happens. But when my dad was watching, it would pick the lock. And then what my dad would do is he would change the lock and put a more challenging lock on the cage and then put the raven back in. The raven would willfully hop back in wait for my dad to lock the uh, a cage and go about picking it again. And so my dad actually had eight different locks and that raven was able to pick all eight locks, but only did it when he was being watched by human beings to uh, what he was bonded. Now, what's interesting, ravens in the wild can't do that. Only ravens that are bonded to a human being are capable of uh, doing that. Uh, and it's another set of biologists that pointed out another major discontinuity between the minds of humans and the minds of even the smartest animals. The smartest animals are not the apes, they're the birds. Ravens are in that category, crows are in that category, jays are in that category. They all have the capability of far outperforming even the smartest of the apes that are out there. But three other biologists said what we've overlooked and what Charles Darwin has overlooked is the fact that we humans have symbolic capability that's not shared by any other non-human animal. 
We don't see it in the Neanderthals, we don't see it in the Denisovans, and we don't see it in the smartest animals that share the planet with us today. And this is what they wrote, and you kind of have to write this way to get published in the scientific literature. <clears throat> they said there is a significant discontinuity in the degree to which human and non-human animals are able to approximate the higher order systematic relational capabilities of a physical symbol system. Now, my wife is an English professor, and she says, you know, we've got to have people to translate this stuff for people who are not scientists. So I'll do my attempt to translate. So I would say, unlike all of you, no non-human animal can appreciate the meaning, the beauty, and the incredible elegance of the Higgs field equations. Look at these equations. Aren't they incredibly beautiful? You know, ravens look at that and they can't see any beauty or elegance in it at all. Uh, but let me give you, I think, a more obvious example. No non-human animal can even read the first page of the first fun with Dick and Jane uh, reader. Now, this is for all of you who are older, right? Because now they've got a different set of books uh, for kids in the public schools. But those of you that are getting close to my age will remember the first reader was fun with Dick and Jane. And the first page is incredibly easy to read, but yeah, no non-human animal is capable of reading. Matter of fact, these three scientists said no non-human animal has any idea what these symbols mean. So they don't know when they have to stop at a stop sign or a railway crossing, uh, but all humans understand uh, these basic symbols. As they wrote, uh, we show that this symbol relational discontinuity pervades nearly every domain of cognition. Only humans are capable of making symbols, understanding symbols, and responding to symbols. No matter how much you try to train your dog, they're not going to figure out what a stop sign really means and what it does. But now they've been doing experiments, and you can see a lot of these experiments again on YouTube, where they're showing that the higher animals really are designed to serve and please us human beings. And they do things when they're bonded to us human beings that they never do in the wild. So I'm actually going to show you a one-minute video clip of a famous uh, bird. It's a cockatoo, and it was owned by a teenage girl, and the teenage girl went off to college. <coughs> and so the parents said, we got to give this cockatoo to some kind of a, a bird sanctuary. So they contacted a bird sanctuary, and they said, here's this cockatoo, but if this cockatoo is going to uh, be happy, it's going to have to have our daughter's music collection. So they gave, uh, along with the bird, a big sack of CDs and said, you need to play these to keep the bird happy. <coughs> well, it turns out that the bird's uh, favorite song uh, was one by the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> and I'm just going to play for you a one-minute video clip. If you go online, you can actually watch a six-minute video clip of what this bird will do. And so here's uh, this uh, bird uh, at... Uh, here we go. Okay, now the context for this is that the teenage girl, her favorite song was that song. And because of how strongly bonded the cockatoo was to this bird, it went all out when that song was being played. And you can see that bird is putting everything physically it can into showing you how much it enjoys that song. And it's not that it's so excited about the song, it's because the bird is so strongly bonded uh, to that uh, teenage uh, girl. But the scientists did experiments on it. They said, is this bird really dancing to the music and keeping beat? So they took that song 
and they played it at about one-third the speed. And what they noticed was this bird would adjust and would dance at one-third the speed. Then they would speed it up three times and the bird would dance three times faster. It really was keeping beat uh, to the song. Now, they've also done experiments with parrots in the wild. And what they discovered is parrots never dance to music in the wild. They will not even dance to the music of uh, the mate that they're trying to reach who is singing a song. So their mate may have a special song, there's no dancing going on. They only do it when they're bonded to a human being. Now this got published just a few years ago. I could have published it 50 years ago uh, when I had my uh, pet parrot uh, named Pedro. So uh, when I was growing up, I had this bird and it was very strongly bonded to me as opposed to the rest of the family. Matter of fact, he potty trained himself because he loved to sit on my shoulder and he quickly figured out I didn't like him messing up my shirts. And so what he would do is he would tug on my ear. That was a signal he needed to go. I'd put him on his little perch. He would go and pop back on my shoulder. I never had a dirty shirt after that. And then every morning uh, he would check my face and say, hey, did, did I miss any spot with my shaving? And he'd find a little hair and sniff it up for me. So I cleaned that up. And uh, you know, after every meal, he would check my teeth and see if anything needed to be taken care of. And he even put his head straight in my mouth, never had a problem there. The thing that annoyed my parents the most is that my grandfather would visit and he would love to play bridge. Uh, and so we'd be playing bridge, Pedro would be on my shoulder, and every time I won a bridge hand, the bird would do a victory dance on top of my shoulder. <laughs> so. And as my parents would say, it's one thing to lose to our son of bridge, but his bird gloats. <laughs> so, however, what I noticed with this bird is at that time in my life, I was really into classical music, and especially the music of a Bach. And uh, my favorite piece was the Brandenburg Third Concerto. Whenever that played, Pedro would do just what that cockatoo would do, would start swaying to the music, dancing to the beat. If I sped it up, it would do all that. But he did not, he was not bonded with my sisters. He really didn't like women. And that's something that you notice with parrots. They either bond to women and hate men, or they bond to men and they hate women. He didn't like my sisters. And they were into his particular brand of rock music. Every time they played that rock music, he would go in a screeching tantrum until they turned it off. But every time I played my music, he would go into this beautiful little dance routine that he would do. And my mother's comment was, uh, Hugh, your, son is a, your bird is a music snob. My bird was not a music snob. The bird was bonded to me, and it didn't matter what music I liked, it was gonna like the music I liked, just like it did with that girl. She was into the Backstreet Boys, and several experiments have shown this is the way it is with these birds. It all depends who they're bonded with. Well, diving into Job 38 and 39, you get a top 10 list. It mentions 10 different species of birds and mammals, and you get a paragraph on each one. So it talks about the lion, it talks about the raven, you get a paragraph on each of these, and what you see in that paragraph is an explanation of how God designed that particular species of bird or mammal to relate to us human beings and to give us the service and pleasure that we need in order to launch and sustain our civilization. And what's interesting is that people groups that lack these animals were stuck in the Stone Age. So for example, if you go to North America, South America, or Australia, when humans came into those areas, what did they do? They quickly wiped out the horses, the cows, the camels, the donkeys and consequently, they were stuck in the Stone Age and had a low population level until Europeans came and brought the animals they needed uh, to elevate themselves out of the Stone Age. And what you see in Job 38 and 39 is that each of these particular species of life was created with unique soulishness to serve or please human beings in their particular distinct way. Each fulfilled crucial roles and launching and sustaining human civilization. And what I find interesting 
Each one challenges the evolutionary paradigm, the idea that life evolves naturalistically. And a couple of examples. It mentions the donkey and the horse. And you look at donkeys and horses, morphologically, they look very similar to one another. In fact, so similar, you can take a horse and mate it with a donkey and you get a mule. That's how morphologically similar they are. However, when you look at the way they've been designed to relate to human beings, it's like a night and day difference. Okay, when you look at the donkey, what it tells us in Job 38, if you lose your donkey and it winds up wandering off into the wilderness, do not worry about your donkey. It's gonna be able to very easily adjust from being domesticated to being wild. And after three months when you find your donkey, it's not gonna stay wild, it'll immediately rebond with you. And so God designed the donkey to go from domestication to being wild, from wild to being domesticated, back and forth. The donkey can do all that. The other thing about donkeys, they're extremely wary of danger. There's a reason why they use donkeys to take people down the Grand Canyon. That donkey is so wary of danger, if it sees danger, it's going to ensure that you who are riding on the donkey are held safe. So if it sees a snake, it's going to back up. If it's getting too close to the edge, it'll kind of make your way around to make sure that you're not going to fall over the edge. <coughs> it helps its owner to avoid risk. It's also very sure-footed. But humans quickly discovered there's a problem with donkeys. You cannot ride a donkey into battle. If you try to ride a donkey into battle, as soon as it sees the arrows coming its way, it heads in the opposite direction. And so it's so motivated to keep you away from risk, you can't take it on any kind of serious adventure. Very different with a horse. As it tells us in the book of Job, the horse loves danger and loves adventure and actually is eager to go into battle with you. Doesn't matter what the risks are. So it's the opposite of what you see uh, with a donkey. Loves adventure, loves danger, extremely obedient and extremely loyal and will sacrifice its life to keep alive its human owner. Uh, my grandfather, for example, fought in World War I and uh, he was part of the Canadian Cavalry and he was decorated many times because his job was to go behind the German lines, spy on them, bring back information. And he said four times a horse sacrificed his life to keep him alive so that he could get back to the Canadian lines. Horses will do that. Uh, donkeys are going to make sure they never have to do that. Uh, they'll walk away from that. The other thing about horses is, of all the animals that we could ride, it's the optimal animal. I mean, the problem with a donkey is if you're tall, even if you're as tall as I am, your feet are going to drag on the ground. Uh, with a horse, it's big enough that your feet won't drag on the ground. But it's also like, like a camel. If you ride on a camel and fall off the camel, you're up so high, you're going to do yourself some serious damage if you fall off the camel. Whereas with a horse, yeah, you might get bruised a bit, but you're probably not going to be seriously injured. And moreover, the horse is designed very much like us human beings, in the sense that it's clothing tolerant, so you can put a big uh, you know, uh, uh, blanket over a horse and it'll accept that, which means you can take the horse on a ride into a cold climate zone because it'll take the clothing. And moreover, it's got an amazing perspiration system. It's next best to us human beings. And so a horse can go into a warm climate. As long as you give it lots of water, it's going to be able to perspire and keep its body cool. So it really is the optimal transportation animal, optimized to such a degree that you say this can't be a product of chance. It can't be a product of naturalistic evolution in every way possible. It's optimally designed to be a transport animal uh, for us human beings. But the main point I'm making here, yes, the donkey and the horse are very similar to one another in terms of morphology, but they're night and day difference in the way they relate to us human beings and how they're designed to serve and please as human beings and night and day difference in terms of their temperament and how they express their emotions to us. Uh, but going back to Job 12, verse 7, Job says to his three friends, ask the beasts and they will teach you, and the birds of the air and they will tell you. 
And what we notice today is that atheism is on the rise. There are more atheists on the planet, and every year the percentage of atheists goes up. But what I've been able to observe is the rise of atheism and people who claim they don't have any religion at all is perfectly correlated with the rise of urbanization. And the thing about urbanization, you get cut off from contact with these animals. You especially get cut off from contact with the wild birds and the wild mammals. You may have domesticated cats and dogs, but you're not going to have contact with these animals. And for the first time in human history, the majority of human beings are living in large metropolitan cities. Now, I've traveled and spoke about science and faith around the world. When I go into the rural parts of the world, especially when I've been in rural Asia or uh, rural South America or Africa, I don't see any atheists there. They all believe in God. Where do I find the atheists? In the big metropolitan cities, where they're cut off from contact with these animals. So I think Job has got a point here. These animals are designed by God to teach us really important spiritual lessons. And so only in cities where there's little contact with soulish animals does atheism thrive. And the rise of atheism is directly correlated with the rise of the percentage of people living in these dense metropolitan cities. They are created to serve and please and relate uh, to a human being. And we especially see this when we go into parts of the world where we're meeting animals that have never had contact with humans. So I make it a point when I'm taking my wife on a vacation to take her to places where I know the birds and mammals there have not seen a human being in over 50 years, which means they've never been abused by humans, they've never been taken advantage of, and you get to see firsthand how God designed these animals to relate to us and to serve and please us. So these are just a couple of photos I've taken. So this is from uh, central British Columbia where you got the mountain goats. And what you notice is how much the mountain goats want to hang around. And it tells us in the book of Job that God designed these goats to be very easily tamed. You can tame a mountain goat in about one minute. That's how easy it is to tame them. In fact, what I've noticed is I'll be walking through the wilds and I got a goat following me. Uh, I sit down for lunch, the goat doesn't want any food, the goat just wants to hang around me. And so uh, that's the way uh, God designed them. And also what I've noticed is you've got these uh, woolly uh, marmots. If you go into the uh, boreal mountains, you'll see these creatures. But here, for example, uh, they typically hide in the rock refuges. But this woolly marmot was hiding in his rock refuge and he saw me and immediately came out to greet me. So here he is coming out to greet me, and then he begins to dance around and actually entertain me with a dance that lasted about six minutes. So here he is getting close to me and uh, trying to show off to me all the neat things that he can do. And uh, you know, this went on, let me take photos. I've even seen this happen with bears. Uh, I was up at 10,500 feet, where usually you don't find any bears at all. But this big 450-pound black bear was startled, jumped out in front of me, looked at me, then he walked off about 30 feet and sat down and let me take photos of him. I figured, hey, if it's sitting down, this is not a threat. The bear, uh, bear just wants to have some contact with me. But this only happens when you're around animals that have never been abused by human beings it shows you that they really were designed by their creator to come to us human beings, to relate to us, and serve and please us. I remember another example where I talked to this park ranger and says, I want to go somewhere where there hasn't been humans in a whole century. And he told me where to go. He says, you're going to have to bushwhack. So I bushwhack into this place. I set up a little pup tent, and I noticed within two hours, I was surrounded by a bunch of birds and mammals. They kept their distance, but they were curious, and they are watching me. I woke up in the morning, and they were inside the buck tent. They wanted contact. They wanted physical contact with me. Now, my cousin who lives in Vancouver Island says this even happens with the big ones. So he told me a story of how he was in a seven-foot, one-man rowboat out in the Georgia Strait. 
And then this huge 50-foot gray whale came up right beside his rowboat. He thought, I'm going to be capsized. The gray whale very gently came up next to his uh, rowboat. And then my cousin John began to stroke uh, the whale. And the whale stood there for a few minutes. Then he said the whale disappeared and was gone. Five minutes later, the whale came back with its calf pushed the calf up so the calf could also have the same experience. This explains why we nearly wiped out the whales. The whales are like passenger pigeons. You know why? The passenger pigeon was the most populous bird species in North America. But they so, had so great a love for human beings, they would fly towards the hunters that were shooting them. And within 30 years, we wiped out all the passenger pigeons. We almost did that to the whales. Because the whales love humans, they come towards the whaling boats and they wind up getting wiped out. My wife and I had a chance to experience this a year ago. We went into the estuary of the St. Lawrence River where there's a sea wall that comes up which pushes up all the plankton. It's the one place in the world where you've got the greatest density of big whales. We were seeing over 100 whales an hour multiple species, but they wanted to entertain us. <coughs> so we were in this uh, small zodiac, and we would watch these big humpback whales charge our zodiac. And we thought, boy, we're going to be uh, all capsized. They would charge the zodiac, and just before they got to our zodiac, they would dive under, go out here, and they would repeat it, and charge us again and dive under. And you could actually see their eyeballs. They actually were having quite a bit of fun uh, entertaining us. So isn't it wonderful that we have these whales and we have the passenger pigeons and all these animals uh, that really want to relate to us? And basically, the lessons that are being learned here is as sin damages our relationships with our Creator, sin also damages our relationship with these birds and mammals. So that's the lesson. As we see how abuse causes these animals to run away from us instead of towards us, it teaches us the same thing happens with our Creator. It's our sin that causes us to run away from Him instead of how we were naturally designed to come to Him and relate to Him. And I talk about many more lessons uh, in this book, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, uh, and also in this book, Improbable Planet. Uh, but the thing we also notice is, is that these animals outperform their wild cousins when they're related to a higher being. Likewise, I've seen this in bringing adults to faith in Jesus Christ. Once they have a relationship with their creator, they outperform what they were doing in the past. And so it's through that relationship with Jesus Christ that our full potential can be realized. So just like we see a difference between the wild birds and mammals and those birds and mammals that are strongly bonded to a human being that they love and trust, we see the same thing with human beings. There's a difference between those who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and those who have a strong, loving relationship with Jesus Christ. But I love the way the book of Job ends. The book of Job ends where God says to Job and his friends, You've been able to tame all manner of birds and mammals. Some of these creatures are easy to tame, like the goat. Some are more difficult to tame. And it says it's the same with human beings. Some are easy to tame, some are difficult to tame. But then he singles out two. He says, of all the nephesh animals, the two that are the most challenging to tame are the behemoth and the leviathan. And there's two whole chapters at the end of Job describing the features of the behemoth and the Leviathan. Now, if you go through Job 40 and 41, you'll notice 21 times you get the words like and as. And this has been a challenge for a lot of interpreters of these texts because some of the sentences are telling us literally what these animals are like. And where you see like and as, it's basically saying, this is how you, a human, will feel if you have a close encounter with this animal. And so, for example, it says of the Leviathan, it's breathing fire out of its mouth. Well, it's basically making the point, if you have a close encounter with the Leviathan and it's opened its jaws with all of its fearsome teeth, 
you're going to feel like it's breathing smoke and fire out of its mouth. It's not literally breathing smoke and fire, but that's how you're going to feel. And it talks about the Leviathan having these uh, shields of protection, basically making the point, if you're 10 feet away from a Leviathan and you've got a stone in your hand, it's not going to do any good to try to defend yourself against this creature because of how well armored it is. You're going to be terrified. So it's basically making the point that both of these animals are incredibly terrifying. When it talks about the behemoth, it actually describes how the behemoth is not a carnivore, it's a plant-eating animal. But it's a territorial animal. And I believe the Leviathan is a reference to the Nile crocodile, and the behemoth is a reference to the hippopotamus. And I've been around both those creatures. You really don't want to get close to a Nile crocodile, nor do you want to get close to a hippopotamus. The hippopotamus is not going to eat you, but the hippopotamus is incredibly territorial. You get near it, it's going to shoo you away. And it's got the muscles and the tusks to do you significant damage. Matter of fact, if you visit Africa, what you notice is the crocodiles hang around the hippos. They know the hippos are territorial. And so they hang around just outside the territory uh, of the, because the, the crocodiles are terrified of the hippos. The hippos are just very strong animals. So they keep their appropriate distance but they wait for a canoe or a boat to come down the river. And as it tells us in the book of Job, the behemoth is an animal you can't see when it's in the water because it's, it's an animal that's easily sunburned. So it feeds at night, but in the daytime it goes into muddy water, submerges its body, and all you see are two nostrils uh, sitting above. But by the time you see the nostrils, you're in their territory. And what do they do? It says they use their tail to capsize boats. The br noun there is Zanab, and a lot of people say it can't be uh, a hippo because a hippo's got a tiny tail. What they don't realize is that Hebrew word Zanab refers to the entire hindquarters of the hippopotamus. And the hippo uses its hindquarters as a weapon. And so it uses that to capsize the boat and the crocodiles know about this behavior and they know they're gonna have an easy lunch. And so they swoop in and actually have been told that crocodiles and hippos are responsible for more than 90% of human deaths by wild animals in Africa. But the way the book of Job ends says, you've actually been able to tame occasionally a leviathan and a behemoth, and it's been done. But the only way you're going to tame a crocodile, you take the crocodile at the moment it comes out of its egg, and you want to humanly handle that crocodile at least an hour every day. I met a man in Florida who had a tame alligator, and he says, yeah, that's how you tame it. You spend at least an hour a day from the time it comes out of its shell. And he says, if you miss a day, you're in trouble. It's got to be every day. They're very difficult to tame. As far as the hippo goes, the only hippos that have been tamed are ones where the hippo is born and the mother dies and humans take over the care of the hippo. And so there's a famous one you can see online where the hippo uh, comes into the South African family uh, for tea every day, uh, drinks about six gallons of tea, and actually joins them for dinner uh, every day. Uh, but they tamed it from the time it uh, came out of its uh, mother's uh, womb. But again, you've got to spend time with it on a daily basis. But the way the book of Job ends is it says, as it takes a higher being to tame a soulish animal, so also it takes a higher being to tame a proud human. Job 41 and 42 ends with God saying, notice it takes a higher being to tame the behemoth and the leviathan, to tame any of these soulish animals. Likewise, not one of you is capable of bringing humility to a proud human heart. Only I can do that. And then he commends Job by saying, Job, you understood this. You came to me for the humility you needed for a relationship with me. Your three friends did not. So it basically the book of Job ends with, I think, a crucial question for all of us. Job humbly submitted to his creator. But how about the rest of us? Will I submit? Will you submit? Job invited his creator to tame him, 
It's something we need to do. And even if you're already a follower of Jesus Christ, it's something we need to do on a daily basis. With that, I'm going to take questions. And as I mentioned last night, I'll take questions in any science faith issue. It doesn't have to be what you heard tonight. But hey, you're on the island of Kauai. There are places in Kauai where humans hardly ever visit, especially in certain regions of the Alakai Swamp. I've gone in those regions. The animals treat you differently. It's a wonderful experience. Don't miss out on it. Yes. Ah, good question. <coughs> okay, what's the significance of Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey? And let me add to that, what's the significance in the future when Jesus comes back in the second coming, he comes on a horse? So the first time on a donkey, the second time on a horse. The donkey is a symbol of peace. The donkey is not going to go into a dangerous situation. And so basically, Jesus in his first coming walked into Jerusalem on a donkey, basically making the point, I'm here to help you make peace uh, with your God the Father. I'm the one who's going to make that possible. On a second coming, he comes on a horse. And a horse is a symbol of war and conquest. And so this is what it tells us in the book of Revelation. When he comes on a horse, it is to defeat the armies that are rebelling against the God of the Bible. So yeah, thank you for picking that up. There's a huge spiritual significance on him coming on a donkey. And by the way, when you read the gospel accounts, what you notice is that those Jewish leaders that were opposing Jesus were mystified that he was coming on a donkey. Why is he coming on a donkey? He was making a point, as he so often does uh, when he tried to pick the fig trees, the figs off the fig tree. Everything he did had a spiritual message to it. Okay, thank you. Who's next? Oh, right here. Go ahead. Sorry. So, with, you're good. With the theme of this evening, a question that I know is asked, asked a lot among believers is Do you think animals have souls? Do I think animals have souls? Well, Nefesh means soulish animal, but the way it's defined is an animal endowed with mind, will, and emotions. We humans are soulish and spiritual. And notice the soulishness of these animals gives them the capacity to relate to a higher species, but they don't have the capacity to relate to God. We alone amongst the animals on the face of the earth have the capacity to form a relationship with God himself. So there's a difference, a huge difference, between the soul of a bird and mammal and the soul of a human being. Now, there's another theological debate you're probably aware of. Uh, are we humans uh, three separate features or two separate features? And so it's a debate that's raging on a lot of seminary campuses. I'm not sure it's all that important of a debate, uh, but one side says we humans are dualistic. We have a physical body and then we have our soul and spirit, and the soul and spirit are inseparable. But then there's another camp that says we actually have three natures. We have a physical nature, a soulish nature, and a spiritual nature. If you want to know where I stand, I believe that the soul of humans cannot be divided from the spirit of humans. And so I hold to a dualistic view. And then, of course, there's an emerging group of theologians who believe that we're strictly physical. They're not saying we're not soulish, but they're saying the soul and spirit of humanity cannot be separated from the body. And so that group is basically saying when a human dies, uh, they also cease to be spiritual and they don't come back to existence until they get their uh, new incorruptible body. So they're basically saying they cease to exist when they die, uh, but they get resurrected later. And I'm not at all, I think that's a, I'd actually put that in the category of a heresy because I think that uh, God made us eternal, which means we never really stop existing. Uh, so, uh, but that is a popular movement today, this idea uh, that we're purely physical. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to, I know you probably wrote a whole long talk on this, but I just want to briefly just see if you could tell us your thoughts on dinosaurs. 
oh, what do I think about dinosaurs? Well, I mean, I got a couple of chapters on dinosaurs and hidden treasures in the book of Job. And basically, I'm making the point that the Bible is inspired for all generations. And therefore, it's not going to use vocabulary that doesn't have some meaning for all generations. Therefore, the Bible is silent on neutrinos. It's silent on Neanderthals. I would argue it's also silent on dinosaurs. Because if this is meant to communicate to all generations of humanity, we would expect the Bible would drop content that only humans that have been alive in the last 200 years would know what it's talking about. So nothing on particle physics. I mean, I got a letter just a week ago from somebody who said, I think Isaiah 45 is speaking about particle physics. And my response back to him is, well, if it is, how would that communicate to people uh, living 2,000 years ago? And basically, it's talking about rain coming down from heaven. He says, I think those are cosmic rays. So I wrote back to him and says, no, I think it's actually rain. It's not cosmic rays. Okay. Uh, and that means we can go too far in trying to see things in the Bible. Just realize, hey, if it doesn't communicate, at least to some extent, to all generations, that's probably an incorrect interpretation. And I say that because there's a lot of Christians who are convinced that Psalm 40 and 41 are speaking about dinosaurs. And uh, I kind of mentioned the, the Zanap. They say, well, it says that the tail of the uh, behemoth is like a cedar log. And they said the tail of the uh, hippopotamus is so tiny, there's no way that figure of speech would be appropriate. But if you're talking about the entire hind quarters of a hippopotamus, that figure of speech uh, becomes valid. And so, uh, now where I do see a possible reference to dinosaurs is Psalm 104. It's a creation psalm which basically says that God packs our planet with as much life as possible, as diverse as possible, for as long as possible. So in that sense, when you've got conditions on planet Earth that would permit the existence of dinosaurs, we would expect that God would create dinosaurs. The reason there's no dinosaurs in the face of the Earth today, there are no big shallow seas. Uh, the big dinosaurs cannot survive without big shallow seas. The biggest land animal you could have on the face of the earth without shallow seas is an elephant. Anything bigger than that, it's going to hurt itself as a result of the law of gravity. But if you've got big shallow seas, the water provides buoyancy. And so the big dinosaur is not going to kill itself because the water is providing it with the buoyancy and the safety. So those big 50-ton uh, dinosaurs you see, whether they be carnivores or herbivores, they were surviving because of shallow seas. I know that's going to spoil your enjoyment for the Jurassic Park movies. Uh, I had a hard time watching them with my sons because says, this is violating the laws of physics everywhere. There's no way a T-Rex can run along a gravel road at 45 miles an hour. It's going to kill itself if it tries to do that. So there's no reason to be terrified when you're trying to run away in a Jeep. It's not going to be able to go very fast. Matter of fact, it's going to be stuck in a shallow sea. It's not going to be on some kind of a roadway. So, but where you do have these big shallow seas, based on Psalm 104, we would expect that God would create animals that take advantage of those big shallow seas. And that's roughly the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous era. But ever since the end of the Cretaceous, our planet has not had sufficiently big shallow seas. Where you do see a hint of that today is the moose. Uh, moose are at a size where they're in danger of hurting themselves, but they spend almost all their waking day wandering around in shallow lakes and feeding on the food at the bottom of the lakes. So that's what uh, keeps the moose uh, going. Yes? When were Adam and Eve created? Well, there's a scientific date based on mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA. And what you see in all over the web is that date is 300,000 years ago. Uh, however, if you actually read the scientific literature, it's 150,000 plus or minus 150,000 years ago. And what is often happening, they take it all the way to the edge of the error bar but the real date is 150 plus or minus 150. 
It's not an accurate date. We do not have any radiometric dating method between 40,000 years ago and 300,000 years ago. Anything that falls within that range, you're not going to have a direct dating method. You only have indirect dating methods, uh, like the mitochondrial DNA. Now, where you do get a more accurate date is from Genesis chapter 2. Because Genesis 2 says that God created Adam and placed him in this garden. And it says of the Garden of Eden, it's a place where four rivers come close together. It names all four rivers. And it tells you the sources of the four rivers. The Tigris and the Euphrates flow out of the land of Asher. It tells us that the Pishon flows out of the mountains of Havilah, which is a mountain range in uh, central western Arabia, and that the uh, Gihon flows out of the mountains of Cush, which would be in the southeast part of Arabia or in uh, the land of uh, Ethiopia. And the point there is, the only time those four rivers flow is during an ice age. Two of the rivers flow today because they're fed by ice melt. Two of the rivers, the ice is melted long ago, and they're dry river beds. But during the last ice age, all four rivers would be flowing, and the only place they come together is what is now the southeastern part of the Persian Gulf. Today is 200 feet below sea level. During the last ice age, it was about 80 feet above sea level. Now what that tells us is that Adam and Eve were created by God sometime during the last ice age, when that region would be above sea level. You say, well, what range do we get there? 15,000 uh, to 120,000 years ago. Still not very accurate, but is better than our best scientific date. And carbon-14 actually tells us it must be earlier than 40,000 years ago. And incidentally, what you see in uh, Genesis 4, for example, is that humans were involved in fairly sophisticated activity. Agriculture, uh, metallurgy, and what's brand new, this is in my uh, most recent book that I just submitted to our publisher, uh, where we now have evidence that humans were involved in planting grains, roasting grains, grinding the grains, and turning them into bread and bakery products. We got evidence that goes back 36,000 years that they were doing that. But it was all on a small scale. Because they're in an ice age where the climate is incredibly unstable, by the way, I will be speaking about climate change tomorrow night and actually go into that. How when you're in an ice age, the climate becomes incredibly unstable. So it explains why we've had difficulty finding these advanced civilization manifestations of early humans. It all had to be done on a very small scale because of how unstable the climate is. But we now actually have newly published evidence that early humans were involved in metallurgy. Now what they were doing, because it was an ice age, they would go into the ice regions and look for meteorites. Well, about one third of all the meteorites are stainless steel. And so they would pick up these stainless steel meteorites and they would cold forge them into sophisticated tools. So uh, this idea that the Bronze Age didn't happen until 3,000 years ago, that's now been pushed back by about 15,000 years earlier. So it really does show you, and this, this is important because I'm actually engaging a group of theologians today that are convinced that humans are evolving mentally. Because they say, if you go back thousands of years, look how stupid these humans were. They just couldn't do anything. And look how bright and brilliant we are today. What I'll be talking about tomorrow night is, for the last thousand years, the climate has been so exceptionally stable, the global mean temperature has only varied by 0 0.06 degrees centigrade. During the last ice age, it was varying by 10 degrees centigrade. So we're talking an instability more than a hundred times greater. And so it's not that we're smarter today, we have the advantage of climate stability. That explains why we have a large population, why we've been able to advance civilization uh, so rapidly, and why herdy humans struggle to do it. They were not any more less intelligent than we were, they were not any less motivated than we were. Uh, there's been no evolution of the human species, there has been an evolution in climate stability. Yes? There's two-part question, if I may. The first one is, who might hold these glasses? I've got 
Somebody found some glasses. Anybody missing glasses? Okay, what's your second part? Yeah, well, one of the lectures I'm going to be giving at Anchor House is on human origins. And we're going to get into all these issues, especially the latest scientific discoveries that deal with them. And what we're basically seeing when we look, there's been about 12 different species of bipedal primates that have preceded us human beings. And the naturalistic evolutionary story is that the earliest gradually evolved through each species to become us advanced Homo sapiens sapiens. But that's not what we see in the fossil record. So for example, uh, the brain size doesn't gradually get larger and larger and we wind up with humans. Rather, the brain size does this. It goes up, it goes down. It goes up, it goes down. There's no linear progression. Same thing with our bipedal capability. We don't see it going better and better as we go from the earliest species up to the most recent. Rather, it does this. Matter of fact, the most recent of the bipedal primates, Homo forensis, had a brain size that of a chimpanzee. It's actually got the smallest brain size of all the bipedal primates that preceded us uh, human beings. And the story you see in the scientific literature, every time we find a new hominid fossil, it throws a naturalistic uh, model into greater chaos, not less chaos. Now, where you do see a linear progression, is in the capability of these hominids to hunt large-bodied bird and mammal species. And so the one that had the greatest capability for doing that were the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, uh, which we're now talking just 45,000 to 200,000 years ago. But the other interesting thing that's newly published about these bipedal primates, their population sizes are no now known to be very small. So, for example, the maximum population size of Neanderthals is 15,000 individuals, more likely only 8,000 individuals. And they were spread over an area about three times the size of Australia, which means the population density is only 0.001 per square mile. And explains why when we look at the DNA of the Neanderthals, we see they're highly inbred. After all, uh, there were so few of them, and they're spread out over such a distance uh, that uh, genetic inbreeding is inevitable. And which explains why the earliest of the uh, Neanderthals, a quarter of a million years ago, compared with the most recent, about 45,000 years ago, we see no difference in their morphology, no evidence of evolution. And now we're seeing that in all the bipedal primates that preceded humans we see no evidence for morphological change. We see no evidence for genetic change. And it's obvious, with a population level that low, there's going to be no evolution going on. Humans are the only ones that multiplied up to a large population size. So now, where we do see a linear progression is their capability of hunting large-bodied bird and mammal species. Now, I think God was involved in that. He knew we humans would sin, and in our sin we would be in danger of driving to extinction the very animals that the Book of Job tells us we critically need to launch civilization. And we were at a conference of anthropologists, and it was Ian Tattersall, uh, we're one of the world's most famous anthropologists, a committed atheist. He went up to my colleague, Fazal Rana, and he said, you know, we're at this conference with all these theistic evolutionists, but I think I've got a lot more in common with you than I have with these theistic evolutionists. And he says, let me share something with you. Notice North America, South America, and Australia had no bipedal primate species preceding human beings. Look what happened to the birds and mammals on those continents. When humans came into Australia, when in a short period of time, they wiped out 94% of all the large body bird and mammal species almost to the same degree that happened in North and South America. Africa, that had all 12 of these species, the extinction rate was only 4%. And explains why Europe, 
Asia, and Africa, humans launched and sustained civilization, whereas that didn't happen in North America, South America, and Africa. Uh, but I'm amazed that it was an atheist anthropologist that pointed out this thing. And he basically said, I think this fits your model a whole lot better than it fits my model. Yes. Bipedal primate species, yeah. In my opinion, what? Okay, what I'm going to be sharing with the Anchor House students is when we compare the technological capability of these uh, bipedal primates, the most advanced of them, uh, with the chimpanzees, we can't see any difference. And so chimpanzees use tools, but the tools they use are always just a single rock. Uh, chimpanzees take advantage of wildfires, but they can't control fire. But when the wildfire breaks out, they gather up all these nuts, throw them on the fire, wait for the fire to be done, they gather up the nuts and then they can break them open. Neanderthals did that too. Uh, they were opportunistic when it came to fire. And so the kind of tool technology we see with Neanderthals cannot be distinguished. And just like the chimpanzees don't wear clothes, the Neanderthals didn't wear clothes. Uh, but Neanderthals took advantage of caves. Well, likewise, we see uh, orangutans and chimpanzees doing the same thing. Yes? Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about, so you were talking about the people having, you know, body, soul, and spirit. Right. Yeah. But I was wondering if you had any insight or if you could clarify a little bit more. Because uh, in Hebrews 4 12, it talks about the Word of God being able to, uh, being like a sword, like a double edged sword dividing the soul and spirit of thunder. So I was wondering if you could give any clarity. Yeah, I can't give you a lot of clarity in Hebrews 4 12, because you know, it talks about God with his sword dividing body, soul, and spirit. And uh, basically, yeah, I think it's making the point, God knows exactly what's going on in your body, soul, and spirit. He can cut right to the quick and point out what your problem is. And uh, you know, what I've written in my book, Always Be Ready, is I run into all these Christians who say, God spoke to me audibly. Well, the only examples of that that I can document are where God speaks a rebuke. So I basically say, did God rebuke you? And I think that's what uh, Hebrews 4.12 is talking about. God will rebuke those whom he loves. And so he will say painful, rebukeful things for you to deliver you from your pride or your rebellion or your sin. And frankly, I don't know of any example of God speaking audibly to modern day human beings where it's not a rebuke. And it's always a rebuke done in love. Hey, you're falling into a problem here. Uh, you're on this prideful path, and if you keep going this way, uh, you're going to be in the same position as Ananias and Sapphira, and God is working to pull you out of that. So, so yeah, when people tell me, hey, God spoke to me, and he tells me I'm supposed to marry this gal over here, I says, well, uh, what did God say to the gal? What did God say to the parents? And it's like, hey, I don't think God was, so this is something you're imagining. Yes. <laughs> Are we extending our lifespan because we're eating dark chocolate instead of milk chocolate? Well, I would recommend stick with the dark chocolate, get rid of the milk chocolate, mainly because milk chocolate's got a lot of sugar in it. And so the sugar may be a bigger issue than the milk. But also uh, with the dark chocolate, it basically uh, raises your good cholesterol and drops your bad cholesterol. If you put milk in the chocolate, it stops that from happening. The milk is not harmful, but it prevents the benefit of the dark chocolate. Now, are we living longer than people who came before us? Well, I think we are just because we got medical advance that people didn't have uh, decades ago. On the other hand, I've been talking to people who specialize in longevity 
And basically, they're making the point, we think the baby boomer generation is going to be the longest lived generation of humanity. And basically, I was sharing with that individual saying, I've got evidence that humans today are living longer than people lived in the days before the flood. And if you look at what it says in the flood text, people were living up to 969 years. But those were the exceptions. The vast majority of humans had their lives terminated by being murdered by their fellow man. So given the fact that, you know, if you lived to be 969 years uh, and you're reproductive for two-thirds of your lifespan and the best birth control method you have is the rhythm method without the benefit of thermometers, uh, that means every woman's going to be having about 150 children. And so the population is going to increase quite rapidly. Matter of fact, without murder being a problem, by the time Adam is 760 years old, he would have filled God's command. God said, multiply and fill the earth. He could have done it in his own lifespan. In fact, very conservatively, if there's no murder, you've got 17 billion people on the face of the earth by the time Adam is uh, 760. And that's presuming people wait 40 years before they have children. Chances are they weren't waiting that long. So on a very concerted basis. But what that implies is the murder rate must have been so high that the average lifespan was below 40 years of age. There was only a rare few individuals that died of natural causes. And if you see that in Genesis 5, maybe those were the few that didn't get murdered by their fellow man. That's a possibility. Now, the reason why people are saying the baby boomers are probably going to be the longest lived generation is that we now have the following generations that are not eating as good a diet as the baby boomers ate. And so we've got an obesity crisis, for example. We also have a crisis that people are too sedentary. And they're not getting in their 10,000 steps a day. Uh, they're not walking three and a half miles per hour when they go for a walk and that is affecting their longevity. And we're already seeing that. Uh, the average lifespan of Americans was consistently rising until about five years ago, where it peaked, and now it's dropping. And you can't blame it all on COVID. Even if you take COVID out, we see a drop in the average American lifespan. So, but hey, it's an easy fix. Get some exercise, mental exercise, physical exercise, and a good diet. It'll help you live longer. The other thing that'll help you live longer, don't retire, but make sure you're not retiring from a job that you hate. Uh, there are studies done in the literature that say people who keep on working at a job they really like live an average of eight years longer than people who retire. retire. You're retired? I wanted to quit next year, and now I don't think I will. No, no, okay. Here's my advice for people who are retired. Find an occupation you really like. I mean, if you don't need the money, you can do whatever you want, right? But find an occupation you really like. Find a ministry you really like and focus on it. Don't just do it an hour a day. Uh, make it a life calling. And you actually see this in the Paul's writings. He says, as you get older, run the race for all your worth. And so think of your life here on earth like a marathon. You want to cross that finish line going full bore. And, you know, when you do a marathon, you cross that line totally wiped out. Well, that's kind of what physical death is, right? I mean, the body wears out. But we're to live our life for the Lord for all we're worth. So don't just retire and sit on a couch and watch TV. You can do that, but you won't live as long. Okay, if there are no more questions, I'll let you all go. I'll be here tomorrow night as well and come with your questions then. Thank you.